Shalom, brothers and sisters. For this week's Thursday's thought, I want to bear my testimony on the prophet Joseph Smith III. I am continuing the series that I started last year where I bear my testimony and discuss my thoughts on various people that the Lord called to help move this work forward. Joseph Smith III, for me, is a very interesting case. And I'm going to start off by telling you like my perspective of him as I was growing up. I wondered why none of you know my when my parents joined that particular church. You know, I learned about things in the Bible like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and I was I wondered, well, what happened to Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith uh, Jr.'s I should say son, or his children? And I was just told, well, they all apostatized. And as I got older, I learned that that meant that. Basically, they went on to not follow Brigham Young and join or you know, join other churches. I think I might be wrong here. I think William was the only brother to start his own church. I might be wrong, but I understand if I understand, if I remember correctly. If I understand correctly, he did eventually join the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Anyhow. The, um, I remember going to the Kirtland Temple on, as a teenager on these, these trips where I was learning about church history. And it was always just kind of like, you got to ignore the fact that these other people that think that they're Latter-day Saints are there. They're, they're, not, they're not really Latter-day Saints. They're off doing their own thing. Just, you know, just be thankful. We're, we're trying to buy this stuff from them, but they're being really reluctant. They're not willing to, dr to join the true church and, you know, that sort of thing. And I remember being curious. I'm like, well, you know, what, what does their Book of Mormon look like? I'm sure it looks the same as ours, right? And it didn't. I was very confused opening up and seeing, you know, verse 300 in, in some chapter in First Nephi. And because I didn't know anything about the original Book of Mormon, I just didn't I understand. I was like, why would they do this? You know, this doesn't make any sense. Why would you, why wouldn't, why would you merge these chapters together? Because I didn't realize that the Brighamites had separated chapters out to make new chapters because, they didn't have a copyright to the Book of Mormon, so they were trying to make changes in hopes that they could have their own version of the Book of Mormon and not get sued. And I don't know why, but no one ever went after them, which is fine. I, I think that's a good thing. I think we should be able to do that. But when I opened their Doctrine and Covenants, that's what really surprised me. The fact that the sections were in different places, the fact that what the church I belonged to at the time had certain things that were in what we called the Pearl of Great Price, um, they call the Pearl of Great Price, were in this Doctrine and Covenants, but there were all these extra sections. And it was one thing that always puzzled me. How is it that Joseph Smith had all of these revelations, but then fell silent once Brigham Young took over? Yes, there's a, a revelation of sorts uh, from Brigham Young. And then there's a dream from Joseph F. Smith, and there's a couple official declarations. But I was always told, in particular with the official declaration on polygamy, that that particular president of their church had a vision. So I go, why, why, why not canonize that vision? That doesn't make any sense. You're putting in this official declaration. You're saying that the saints sustain this policy change, but then it's an oral tradition as to why it happened. There's, there's nothing canonized to explain that it was done through prophetic revelation. And to be clear, I do believe that it was, and that that vision is actually in Doctrines of the Saints for the Fellowship. But then I turned, and, and I will admit, I was envious. I, I, I turned to these, these sections, I know, who are these prophets, who are these men? Joseph Smith III, okay, that guy, that makes sense, it's obviously Joseph Smith's son. You know, some other Smiths, those must be his sons. And, and I knew enough about them. I knew a little bit. And so I knew that there was some sort of thing where someone had to be a blood relative of Joseph Smith in order to be president of the church at that time anyway. And I just, I was blown away. And so the next time I went back, I brought enough money. I really wanted to buy a copy of their Doctrine and Covenants. And I was discouraged not to. But I still, I still read out of it. And I was very curious. How had they, I had heard, because I, I had asked at some point, you know, how did they address the, the ban on the priesthood for, for, for blacks? And it was explained to me, well, they didn't, they didn't have that ban. Well, it didn't make any sense to me. If that ban came from Joseph Smith 
and it was a revelation from God, then, then why didn't they have it? Well, I, I found out it's because it wasn't the revelation from God. It didn't come through Joseph Smith. It, it was a Brigham Young thing. It didn't even start until the idea didn't even come about until winter quarters. And so when that question was asked for the reorganized church, they had a revelation. And so when I asked the person there at, at their bookstore at the time, I said, you know, how how did you guys deal with, with blacks and the priests? They said, oh, we, we have a revelation here. It's in the Doctrine, Doctrine and Covenants. Read this. And I did. And I felt the Holy Spirit tell me this is true. The Lord does want to ordain everyone. They need to be worthy. And for the times, I understand that the language was written for that time. And, and obviously, if someone received a revelation on that topic today, it would not be worded the same way. It's worded in a way that both reflects the time, but also reflects the eternal principles of the Lord. That race is something that we see as human beings and not something that, that God really is concerned about. There, there is no master race. I've talked about that in, in other Thursday thoughts. And so I asked, you know, on the way back from this, this youth trip, I asked the leaders, I said, where's the revelation about banning and, re and then getting rid of the ban? And they're like, well, we don't really have that anywhere. You know, we have, we have it right here. We have this, this uh, official declaration. And I, and I was like, but, but, but if we are led by prophets, why, why don't we have revelations like they do? And I asked that. I said, you know, I, I looked through Dr. Cummins. They have all these revelations. And is our canon closed? Oh, no, we have a living prophet. We have the only living prophet. Their stuff, it's priestcraft. It's not even real. you got to ignore that. I'm like, but they were right. Oh, no, they're right now, but we were right then. And I grew to love that particular branch of our faith because when I talked to the people, they were very genuine and very honest. They really took the time to think about the questions that I asked them. Because I went to Kirtland a lot when I was younger. And I, I talked to them. I, I talked to, to members of their faith quite a bit. And, and I prayed on it. I was like, am I supposed to go and join this church? Is this the true church? And I just kept being told to stay where I am. I wasn't told that any church was the true church. But I was told to stay. I needed to be where I was. And so I stayed there. I like to think that I had to stay there until I could meet and marry Christine, my wife. So that's my reflection on my memory of, of getting to know Joseph Smith III. Some of the things that really confused me were if this is if this church, the, the reorganized now community of Christ, is the correct flow of things, why is it that so many things were left out? Well, there was a number of reasons I discovered. Number one, they reject the Nauvoo period. They basically have a Kirtland period church mingled with some things from Missouri. They have revelations that were canonized before Joseph Smith died that they don't, they've actually removed some. I shouldn't acknowledge that, but they, they don't really preface those or, or use those very much. And on the other hand, what I didn't realize was that it's not like Mormonism froze into this block and Brigham Young and all of his successors were just like, you know, well, we're not getting anything new from God, so we're just going to do this. No, Brigham Young invented a whole new religion. In fact, there was a, 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 a court ruling that stated that looking at the theology, the organized church was given certain properties and things because they clearly were the real church that followed Joseph Smith's teachings. And so they were more like the original church. And having worship with them, and seeing how they function, they still function a lot more like the original church than the Salt Lake City Church or any of their, their branches. They're not as controlling and domineering over their people, which is one of the reasons why they've had a number of splits. But again, I don't think that splitting is necessarily a bad thing. I don't think we all need to be lumped together in the same church. So then why did the Lord call Joseph Smith the third? Well, I, I want to make sure you know, and this is in uh, Epistles of the Saints, Joseph Smith III prayed the Lord on what to do, and God told him he had two options. Two options. Um, he could basically go out west and rule this, this really large organization, or he could help a small, struggling church. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing this. 
that really was never probably going to get as big as what was happening out in Utah. And knowing full well that Brigham Young, Brigham Young, Sidney Rigdon, and James Strang had all prophesied that, or at least stated that they believed, that Joseph Smith III was supposed to eventually take over his father's place, he, in my opinion, very wisely did not go out west. And from what I know of Brigham Young, I mean, I can tell you my ancestor ran away. I've, I've mentioned this before because you know, he didn't like how controlling he was. He was a very domineering man. I'm not positive that Joseph Smith III, I mean, the Lord definitely would have, would have had to have angels protecting him on his way out to Utah and until Brigham Young died. There's no way he was going to step down. And it's very clear that he was trying to set things up so that his children were the ones who took over the Salt Lake City Church. And that obviously did not happen. He, he failed in that regard. Regardless, Joseph Smith III decided that he would join a church that had formed in April of, I don't remember the year, but, but that same year that he made the decision, called the Ch Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There's a myth that he's the one that started this church. That is not true. There were a number, number of people that left James Strang's movement. So there were Strangites. And then people from Sydney Rignans and people didn't join anything. And I'm sure that there are people from the Salt Lake City Church that had left. They all came together and decided to reorganize the church, which is why it's called the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And you'll notice that the way that they spell out Latter-day Saints without the dash is like Joseph Smith Jr.'s church and like James Strang's church. So in my mind, this is what makes it really interesting to me. It's very clear to me that Joseph Smith III is a successor to James Strang. Okay, he, he may not be the one that they're looking for because he didn't take anything basically after Nauvoo with him to start this church. So in a sense, he did continue the movement of the Restoration forward, but he also took it backwards. And that's what I find the most fascinating. And, and I really had to struggle with this when I was investigating Community of Christ. I was like, how do I deal with this reality that God's always trying to move forward? And yeah, Joseph Smith III, and, and I remember being in, in the 90s in the Kirtland Temple talking to one of their people there about this. And he was like, yeah, there's just too much controversy. He didn't want people to keep getting killed like what happened you know, when, when his father was, was in charge, when he was the president of the church. So he pulled it back to what seemed more reasonable. And he was right. It worked. They were safer. They, they weren't hunted down like other Latter-day Saints have been in the past. At the same time, though, I think that's one of the reasons why they stayed small, because the more that they become more like mainstream Christianity, the more they lose their uniqueness. And, and I've talked to members of their church in my local area who are like, yeah, you know, now that we're not using the Book of Mormon in that particular congregation, not in Community of Christ, Community of Christ still acknowledges the Book of Mormon Scripture, but every branch, every congregation chooses for themselves how they're going to run things. And and the one I was attending at that time had decided not not really to focus on the Book of Mormon. And they're like, you know, I might as well just go ahead and go to this other church. There's more people, there's more resources, there's more going on, it's more interesting. And so they, they left the Latter-day Saint movement. They still consider themselves Latter-day Saints, the people that I talked to. And they didn't have a problem coming back to help when needed. But at the end of the day, there, there really wasn't any point in being a part of Community of Christ anymore. And that, in my mind, is the fear of, of moving, or not the fear, that in my mind is the problem of moving backwards. The Lord needed Joseph Smith III to do this, to create a safe place for these saints. And he did for a very long time. Now, there were revelations by Joseph Smith III and others condemning polygamy. And I will say that this is this is where the butting of heads, I, I'm not going to turn this into a polygamy discussion, but I don't believe Joseph Smith's revelations that polygamy itself is a sin. But I, I also, at the same time, don't believe that Brigham Young's idea of collecting women to get into heaven is righteous either. So I, I don't think these revelations really butt heads. I think our interpretations of them do. I think that understanding that polygamy can be done incorrectly, just like monogamy can be done incorrectly, makes the revelations that the prophets from Community of Christ have had 
absolutely correct. At the same time, I also think that denying personal revelation, family revelation to those that have been called to become polygamist is also wrong. And so it's interesting to me that they have this weird dynamic where their, their congregations can choose whether or not to accept the Book of Mormon right now. But at the same time, families can't decide whether or not they should be polygamists. And I find this opposition of freedom and lack of freedom to be intellectually interesting, but spiritually debilitating. Now, once again, to be clear, for those who are seeing one of these videos for the first time, I am not a polygamist. My wife and I are not interested in being polygamists, but we still support polygamists. Those that, as long as they are consenting adults, doing their best to follow the will of the Lord. Uh, we do not, I do not, and my family does not agree with the idea of collecting women to get into heaven like Brigham Young taught. That's a ridiculous idea. So all that said, what do we do with Joseph Smith III? Well, I, I encourage you to read over his revelations. I encourage you to read over the revelations of his successors. I, I really feel that there is a lot of, of good things in there, particularly recently. Uh, Grant McMurray, Steve Beasy, they've had some amazing revelations that we've included in Doctrine of Saints because they really speak to what Zion truly is and loving and accepting our neighbors. They are additional witnesses. They are fellow prophets teaching this idea of accepting all people no matter what. And all of Joseph Smith III's revelations that are in that particular Doctrine and Covenants are either in Doctrine of the Saints or if they weren't actual revelations in Epistles of the Saints along with some of his other writings. So we in the fellowship definitely do see him as a prophet of God, just like Joseph Smith Jr., just like James Strang. Should you accept him as a prophet, seer, and revelator? Well, again, I would encourage you, read over the revelations that he had. Pray on them for yourself. Does that mean you need to join the community of Christ or one of the other reorganized branches? And I know reorganized branches is the name of one of their branches, but I mean any of the branches, any of the churches that, that left the community of Christ or the RLDS church. That's really between you and God. That's something you have to figure out for yourself. Now, I will say that out of the four apostles that we had at one time here in the fellowship, one was a Strangite, one had come from uh, the community of Christ back when they were called the RLDS church, and one came from one of those reorganized branches, and the other one was a uh, uh, Snuffrite. So, people can be called to work in the fellowship from all backgrounds. And so, I believe that anyone that is called to help these people grow needs to go there and help them. I believe that if the Lord is calling you to one of these churches, you should absolutely attend. You should absolutely worship there. And you should be as engaged as the Lord and they feel are appropriate. And... There has been one exception where a brother in England was told that he had to choose between the fellowship and the community of Christ. But other than that, I mean, the people I was wor worshiping with, they knew full well about the ecumenical movement that I was leading and a part of. It's not like I really keep it a secret. You Google my name. It's right there. And I know there's others that are involved in various branches of the community of Christ that, you know, like I said before, have been involved in the fellowship. So please don't think you can't have dual citizenship if you feel called to be a part of one of their groups and, and their branch of our shared faith. I will tell you, point blank, I have a very special love for them. And at one point, I really strongly considered just, you know, throwing all this away and, and becoming a member of Community of Christ. But my wife reminded me, no, this isn't what you were called to do. Could I help there? I, maybe. But that's not what the Lord wants me to be. I I had been asked by them and, and told by them, you know, we have a place for you if you'd like to be here. We, we have roles for you to fill if you'd like to be here. Um, you know, and, and I love them so much. I, I really would love to be there. Unfortunately, the Lord has called me to keep moving things forward. And there are things that, for me personally, are just too far backwards. I, I don't have the same understanding of 
Doctrine and Covenants 76 as a Salt Lake City Church, but I also don't just kind of leave it as a hypothetical theology like some in the community of Christ do. I have a very strong testimony of the Book of Mormon, and it's gotten me kicked out of a lot of Facebook and social media groups that are associated with, but not actually endorsed by, that particular branch of our movement. And I believe in ritual magic. So, obviously, I'm, I'm going to still want to practice the temple rituals with people. And I don't really want to go into their particular branch of our faith and say, hey, I'm here. You've got a temple. Let's, let's do some temple worship in there. Let, let's do some, some temple rituals. And at the same time, I, at one point, I even talked to uh, one of the pastors, and he seemed fine with it. He's like, you know, what do you do if people want to come, come here to the community of Christ, and they, they want these temple rituals? And I was like, I'll give them to them. I'm, I'm, I'm endowed. I have the keys. I, there's no reason why I can't give, it, give them to them, why we can't do them. And he's like, hmm, okay. Um, but then at that point, we're really starting something new that's just next to community of Christ. And the one thing, and I'll just say this real quick. I know this is running along. The one thing I saw and that bothered me when I was in the community of Christ, and, and it, it, did, it did kind of hurt me too, was I felt like there were three, and, and these are three extremes. Obviously, there's going to be people that you know are, are various portions of these, but I felt like the three extremes were those that just wanted things to go back to the way they were with the RLDS church. Those who wanted to just give up on the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith altogether, and move forward as just another Protestant church, restorationist Protestant church. And I saw Latter-day Saints coming in, wanting to basically turn Community of Christ into a more accepting, more inclusive version of the Salt Lake City Church. And I realized that if I was willing to do temple rituals with people, then am I just falling into that third category? These people have a rich history. Who are we as former Brighamites? to go into their church and say, hey, you've been doing it all wrong. Let's fix this. In my mind, what they need to do is figure out the first two. Do they want to continue with the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith? How far back do they want to go to being like the RLDS church? Now, they're still receiving revelations. Their, their prophet, seer, and revelator is still receiving revelations. So they are still at least that far in. And I, I pray that that continues. But I can't be there trying to encourage them to continue with the Book of Mormon. They have to decide their own sacred story as a people. And I would encourage you to allow them that, that, that grace, that opportunity for themselves. If you do feel called to worship with them, to join their church, please go there humbly, not as a warrior. Go there submissive. They're to help encourage those on both sides work out their differences and figure out how to meet, how to make common ground. Don't go in there trying to reinvent their wheel because they've got their wheel pretty well carved out. So that said, I do want to bear you my testimony that Joseph Smith III is a prophet. In fact, I want to go a step further and bear my testimony that Steve Beasy is a prophet. I've read his revelations, and they are of God, and I want to bear you my testimony of that. I want you to know that these are a sacred people with a sacred story that have held on to a lot of good things in our movement, that, like, like democracy, for example, that a lot of other branches of our shared faith have let go of. Has it caused problems for them? Yes. Is it worth it? Absolutely. So that's my Thursday thought and my testimony, and I leave it with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.